something of Baptist history, and last week we looked at uh, the uh, Great Awakening and one of the great um, men of God that came out of that was the man Isaac Bacchus, if you remember, and uh, his leadership, especially in the formation of the country. And in that same revival, the uh, Great Awakening, um, almost identical dates here, we have another man, actually two men, but we'll focus on one, and we've talked about this man over and over, he's he's a favorite in Baptist history. But uh, so the period of the period of 1755 to 1775 is very exciting in American Baptist history. Um, there are uh, many things in American history and the on the, uh, the revival side and the uh, on the Christian side that are sometimes overlooked. But there was a great revival that spread. I just talked about the Great Awakening, but several years later, that spread in 1755 from North Carolina. And it began in 1755, and, and really it was that revival that, that uh, laid the foundation for the spread of the gospel across the south. And as the settlers moved, moved west across those southern states, uh, the great revival that overtook that area. But um, the man we're talking about today, he was born, Shubal Stearns was born in Boston in January 1706. He was raised in a congregational church, as almost everybody was. That was the state church. And in 1740, as we mentioned last week, the Great Awakening swept across New England uh, because of the, uh, the uh, this kind of started with the, the preaching of George Whitfield, and Stearns was saved during that time. Uh, he, uh, as many converts did, we talked about this last week, but I just want to, I think it's good to, to remember that many converts began to grow in the Lord, uh, began reading their Bibles during this time, and they began to realize that the teaching they were getting from the congregational, uh, congregational church was an error, and uh, they, they, they could not find the, many of the teachings. And so these new lights, as you remember, we had the old lights that stayed, that, that were the old uh, congregational members, and these new lights, as they were called, eh, it might have been kind of a derogatory term by some of the old, the old lights, uh, calling them that, but uh, uh, these new lights or come-outers, um, they formed when they, when they realized that they were not going to uh, conform the church from the inside, the, the congregational church, they came out of that church, and they started churches... Um, just kind of known as separatist churches, some, some Baptist churches. And Stearns uh, joined with the separates in 1745. Eventually he was baptized, and he was convinced that God had called him to preach, so he was ordained into the Baptist ministry. Um, he began to travel and preach. Soon he was pastoring in Connecticut, later in Virginia. But in June of 1755, he received a letter from, uh, I believe it was a lady in North Carolina, uh, telling of uh, the sincere desire of those people in, in North Carolina to, to, I guess they were just totally, there was, there was no biblical preaching in the, in the entire area, and just a destitute, spiritually destitute area. And the letter said this, it said, the work of God was great, the, the work of God would be great in preaching to an ignorant people who have little or no preaching for a hundred miles and no established meeting places. But now the people are so eager to hear that they would come from 40 miles each way, uh, uh, if, if we had the opportunity to hear a sermon. And this was the letter that he received. Um, Stearns had felt for some time that God was calling him somewhere else other than uh, the uh, New England, and uh, he thought it was to go west with the, uh, with the settlers, but um, he was uncertain what God wanted to do, and he felt that this, was, this letter really was directing him, uh, this, this was used of God to direct him into God's will. So, but he was sure this was from God. He, he got his affairs together. He had a small church there, remember, in, um, there, and uh, he got his church in order, and he encouraged as many members as he could to come with him. Uh, come with me to North Carolina. Uh, this is not just jumping on I-75 or I-95 and, and driving down the, down the pikes. Remember, they're up in New England, and uh, there's only one way to do that, and that's on horseback and walking. And so he had encouraged his members to do that. A few, a few did follow him. Uh, it would be five couples uh, decided to move with Stearns and his wife. One of them was his sister and her husband, Daniel Marshall, who we'll study another time. But um, when he decided to move south, he was almost 50 years old. And um, in the end, this group of 16 separate Baptists made their journey from New York through Pennsylvania, down through Virginia. And um, almost like Abraham, 
uh, in the scripture, they, they, were, they weren't sure, Stearns was not really sure where God was leading him. He was, he was, he was looking for leading from the Lord, where to stop and where to build, build his church. And um, this week, November 22nd, 1755, um, these, these eight couples constituted the Sandy Creek Baptist Church and called Shubal Stearns to be his pastor. Um, he had, was, um, came into the area of North Carolina, really the, 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 uh, north, uh, be the northeast corner of, of uh, North Carolina. Um, and um, they had come across a, a juncture in the trail which, which was uninhabited, but it was really a place where a lot, of, a lot of trade took place, a lot of people crossed this juncture. And I think, um, yeah, you see that, there's the original church. Um, it was up on a hill, I don't think you can tell right there, but it's up on a hill and overlooked this juncture. And um, um, he wasn't there for economic reasons, but he was there to preach the gospel. And he thought if he could, if he could find a place where, where all those people crossed, he could set up a church and a community and uh, preach the gospel from there. So they built this first meeting house as what, what was be the center of their new community. Uh, they began building houses around that meeting house. Those don't exist anymore. This, this does. Uh, but uh, and they gathered food for the coming winter. And really what happened here is really uh, uh, the wisdom of this decision is still impresses historians what, what, what he was able to do at this point. So he began preaching as soon as he could install a pulpit in that building. And um, the singing of this little congregation, he encouraged them to sing as loud as they could. And the, the singing could be heard for 10, 15 miles because it was just, there was nothing out there but farms, you know, out there. And uh, so curiosity was raised. What in the world? Where is that singing coming from? And it was that initial, those initial meetings that got people to walk and to ride horseback, some coming 30, 40 miles in to see what the commotion was. Um, and, um, and so he, he quickly began to build his ministry there. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the neighboring farms, as I said, people from neighboring farms came um, to, heard, to hear really the preaching that they maybe had not heard in years, maybe ever. And uh, they were quick to acknowledge that they had never met anybody like Shubal Stearns. He was a very unique man. His, his, uh, there aren't any pictures of him or drawings of him, but a uh, very unique looking man, I guess. And, uh, and his style of preaching was, was very unique also. Um, he, he had two men assist him because he expected that the church would grow. He, he chose his, his brother-in-law, Daniel Marshall, another man named Joseph Breed. Um, the membership of Sandy Creek Baptist Church just grew very, very quickly. Uh, the, the membership grew from 16 to over 600 people in just a matter of about a year. Uh, people coming from all over. This was just the beginning. And uh, the, we're not going to look at this week. We're going to look at next week. But what, what, what happens next is... Is uh, historians say they use the term breathtaking, just what, what God would do now in this, in this work. Really amazing. Revival would sweep across this area. Uh, of course, persecution would follow very quickly as uh, the Church of England uh, did not uh, tolerate what was going to happen. And, um, but, but in that persecution, the church began to grow more and more. Um, the, uh, I read a historian this week, um, George Washington Pascal, he said, um, I, I make bold to say that these separate Baptists uh, there in North Carolina have proven to be the most remarkable body of Christians America has ever known. It's quite a statement. And uh, we're going to see what happens next week and why he would say something like that. But this morning I want to thank the Lord for these, these brave pioneers. Of course, Shubal Stearns is the leader. and he's, he's God's man. But you think about the, 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 the bravery, the courage it took for these families to say, hey, we'll strike out with you. Where are you going? I do not know. We're just going south, and uh, God will show us. And uh, so think of that. And this was, again, not like jumping in our cars or vans and taking a trip down south. Uh, this was walking through wilderness and, and really terrible conditions. And so and thank the Lord for, for, this, for this man and his leadership, and we'll, we'll continue this uh, next week. But this is a very important week in Baptist history, uh, this week of November 20th, uh, and for what God did uh, through, this, through this man, Shubal Stearns.